Well, thank you all for uh, being here with us. Uh, it is kind of late in the US, but uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, introduce some of you or uh, give you examples if you already know about scanning microwave impedance microscopy. Uh, so give you an introduction, uh, an overview of the um, operation of the system, and then I'll go into some case studies, uh, mostly based on semiconductor devices, uh, FA and uh, and uh, characterization, and close with a brief sum summary. So um, ScanWave is the uh, implementation of scanning microwave penis microscopy for Prime Nano. It's a technology that came out of Stanford University, and uh, we have exclusive rights to it. It's a near-field microwave AFM mode. It's one of the younger techniques, um, so there's still a lot of applications to discover. Um, what we measure is the relative capacitance, resistance. We can do DCDV, DRDV, nano CV, quite a lot of capabilities in the electrical realm. But the interesting thing is that this is microwave based. So we're not actually sending a current through the sample. So I'll go into that in, in a lot of detail. Um, uh, we've pushed the sensitivity of the system. So we had trouble finding a sample that will measure it. Uh, we finally did with NIST and it's about 0.075 attofarads. Quite a, quite a nice surprise for us that uh, we have such amazing sensitivity to capacitance. Our spatial resolution, typically we achieve about 10 nanometers, but on the bottom right here is, a, is an image of a, um, let me get a pointer, oops, sorry. Uh, back again, let me get a pointer here is an image of um, um, bilayer graphene. I think that was mentioned in a previous uh, presentation. Under ideal conditions, this, um, this did give a, a resolution of about one nanometer lateral. So we know we can get sub tip radius resolution and I could explain that offline. Um, and the microwaves allow us to go subsurface and image features underneath the, the top surface and go a couple hundred nanometers deep. And uh, the latest development from us is uh, uh, quantifying dopant uh, levels in semiconductors. Um, and we can do a, a quite an array of electrical measurements and material types. So how does this work? Uh, we are using a fixed frequency of about three gigahertz. And that is uh, transmitted to a, a, a custom cantilever. It's also a patented process that we uh, have manufactured. There is impedance matching all the way to the uh, back end of the cantilever. So we have uh, impedance matching uh, as far as we can. And then uh, we have a shielded probe. I'll show pictures of this. So the, the uh, tip of the cantilever becomes the emitter of the excitation signal, the microwaves, and it's also the collector. So um, we are collecting the reflected microwave signal from the sample <clears throat> and that gets demodulated and uh, it has two components. Uh, it has a real and an imaginary component. The imaginary component is uh, relative capacitance and the real component is uh, relative, uh, it's conductivity and permittivity technically, but that translates to resistance and capacitance. You can overlay to the um, uh, microwave signal uh, an AC signal and with a lock-in amplifier do DCDV and you can get dopant information on semiconductors. Uh, you can identify the type and, and the level of dopants, um, the polarity that is, and also do DRDV. <clears throat> In addition to that, you can add a DC signal and, uh, and ramp the DC signal. So I'll show examples of that. All right, so uh, these are pictures of the system. Um, top left, the three, these are the main three components. Uh, there's a probe interface module. This is what holds the probe. And right on this little piece here is, a, is the impedance matching we do. Uh, this is a extremely low power, uh, extremely low noise power supply that powers the RF generator. And here you see it installed in a, in a system in our lab, the RF generator. Um, connected to the probe interface module, and then there would be the cantilever here on the head, uh, and the power supply sits outside. A little bit about the probes, uh, the cantilevers, you see an SEM picture here. Uh, zoom in into the uh, tip itself. It's a py pyramid shape uh, with a very hard uh, alloy metal. Um, so these tips can last uh, hundreds and thousands of scans, and there has been studies done for that. Uh, it's a hard metal again, and uh, there's a cross-section showing here the, the metal coating. 
Um, and typically they, they last as long as until you hit something or pick up some dirt. So um, they're quite durable. Uh, here's a schematic of a cross section showing that this is shielded all the way to the tip. And so we have low uh, loss and they're manufactured in a MEMS uh, factory in a wafer form, and then they're diced up. And this is a single uh, probe shown here that would be loaded onto the um, probe interface module and attached to an AFM system. So what is it that we actually measure? We measure the relative uh, localized relative permittivity, uh, conductivity, and then with an AC signal, we can do DCDV and DRDV. Um, and I'll show examples, uh, real life examples on these uh, measurements. And we still get a topography channel. So that's uh, an additional one. So we get six channels, up to six channels of information on the microwave and then the topography. That these can be combined any way you'd like or separated and seen individually. So um, there was a presentation which was on uh, scanning capacitance and uh, uh, that was uh, uh, quite a nice uh, explanation of it. Here I'd like to compare the different electrical modes for AFM, uh, the scan wave, the scanning capacitance and spreading resistance measurements. Um, spreading resistance uh, has uh, the highest resolution, spatial resolution, um, but the uh, SMIM actually has the highest range of dopant that it can detect. Um, again, the sensitivity of how we do this measurement can go down to intrinsic silicon for dopant variations, uh, and we can identify the dopant type. Um, and they can run in contact, tapping mode, lift mode, dark lift, any of these modes are supported. We can make these measurements in those modes. Um, another important thing is that the response of the signal to dopant levels is log linear. And that makes easy uh, quantification. The, uh, there's no complicated algorithm to use a reference sample and then do quantification of dopants. And following, we're going to do that with uh, dielectric constant. Um, because we're using microwaves again, I'm going to repeat this. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, a different approach. And uh, we don't have to send a, a current through. We don't have to have a grounded sample. Um, we can be looking at an exposed dielectric. We can be looking at a sample that's sitting on a dielectric. Uh, there's no real sample uh, prep requirements other than exposing the area that you want to see. Uh, and I mentioned that our probes are shielded metal um, and uh, we can do all of these types of measurements. So let's look at the response of the uh, SMIM signal to uh, the microwaves to uh, first dopant concentration. So we, uh, we made some samples because we couldn't really find off the shelf uh, very low doped, intrinsically doped. So we had samples made with very low doping and intrinsic silicon so we could measure the response down to that level. And then uh, we also have a sample that's not shown here that goes up to 1 in 20, uh, but I will show it in future slides. And the, the um, response is uh, log linear, and that means it's easy to predict a value if you have a, at least a couple of points on this curve from a reference, and we do that. Um, the next uh, uh, film that we can uh, quantify but haven't done yet would be dielectrics, and uh, here is uh, almost uh, over two decades of dielectric constant, uh, and looking at the relative signal, experimental, and the model, uh, values. And uh, again, this is also a log linear, um, leading us to uh, an easy quantification and being able to find the K value of dielectrics. So now I'm going to go into some case studies. Uh, first, we'll look at uh, buried structure imaging. Uh, then we'll go into the dopant imaging, um, then nano CV for fault isolation. Um, one thing that's, uh, we don't have to be actually scanning to take measurements, we can do point measurements, and that's what I'll show here. Uh, I'll go into a, an integrated uh, gate bipolar transistor device uh, for defect localization, dielectric film characterization in FA, uh, some thin fed images, uh, nonlinear materials, and nanowires at, at the end. So let's look at very structure imaging. So we had this uh, structure made, which has uh, silicon dioxide islands uh, inside a silicon nitride, uh, a sea of silicon nitride, if you will, 
we polish this down to about uh, 280 nanometers. And when you do a topography scan on the surface of this, there is really no topography because it was polished flat. But when you look at the microwave signal, we get quite a, an interesting and strong contrast between the two, um, the two films because the, the permittivity of each is uh, quite different. There's a, SiO2 is 3.9, silicon nitride is 7.5. So that gives us a, a great contrast between the two. And we can also image uh, quite deep into the sample. Another uh, through, this is through silicon imaging. Uh, this is the backside of a memory device. And this, this is a non-volatile uh, memory device. And uh, what you see here is a collage of images, uh, different scans uh, covering quite a large area of this chip. And then the topography uh, accompanying it. But if you look closely in here, the two different colors represent a different charge, uh, a charge and a non-charge, the, the orange and yellow, indicating whether it's a charged or not charged uh, memory cell. So you can do some cybersecurity and other types of work with this, um, with this technology. Now let's go into dopant uh, imaging and nano-CV. Uh, I mentioned to you that we have a sample that goes uh, beyond what I showed on the graph. This is it, this is a, an implant reference sample. It is a, a really nice sample to have. Uh, we provide this in our quantification uh, product. There are 10 uh, dopant levels of N in a staircase, if you will, starting from about E15 going up to E20. And then adjacent to that is 10 P-type uh, dopant doped uh, regions uh, in a staircase going down from about uh, 1E20 down to 4E15. So we use this for a lot of uh, our work and also to quantify dopant levels. Uh, you can see here the capacitance response to the different levels of, of dopant. Um, the capacitance in our case is really volts. That's the output of our system. For both resistance and capacitance, we output volts. So what can we do with this? Well, we actually uh, naturally have a, in a semiconductor environment like I'm showing here, because of the native oxide, we don't actually have to grow an oxide. We have an MOS device, our metal tip, the native oxide, either on the tip of the device or both acts as the insulator. And then we have the semiconductor below. So if we sweep a, a, a voltage uh, on our tip, as we're doing the microwave measurement, we can actually get a CV curve. So if you have a P-type device, um, the uh, the negative area is going to accumulate, so you're going to have higher capacitance in the negative bias, and the opposite is true for the n-type device. So I'll show applications of this. Um, so this is a, these are nano CV curves. These are curves that are acquired by just positioning the tip on each of these stripes at the nanoscale and sweeping the voltage, and you can see the CV curve for the n-type 10 stripes and the p-type 10 stripes. Uh, the higher the dopant, the less of a, of a change you have because it's already very conductive and you're not getting much difference in the accumulation of the carriers underneath the surface. Um, and uh, as the less the dopant is, the uh, more of a swing you get as you go from, from negative to positive bias. Um, so here's a, uh, an image sensor um, that has been exposed and you can see the different uh, uh, dopant types. This is doing DCDV uh, to get this image. Uh, the phase of the DCDV tells us the polarity of the dopant, uh, red being um, uh, N-type and blue being P-type. And then we can place the probe in a, in a single position and do CV in that. And that's what's shown here. Location one is, um, is the CV curve for that particular location. So you can do uh, nanoscale FA, and I'll show another example coming up. And this is position two, the P-type, uh, showing the CV curve for it. So um, that, that's, um, that is the, um, <clears throat> the photo detector, uh, the photocathode area of CV curves. So in here, I'll show you an example where there was a defect and this was a non, 
visual defect by normal techniques, SEM, uh, optical microscope. Uh, and by comparing a, a known good device to this device and doing nano CV across uh, this, uh, this section of the device, we were able to identify that there was an N type uh, region here that wasn't supposed to be there. And on the known good device, this didn't exist, but the uh, nano CV in that area identified an N type in the P well that was not, did not belong there. Um, and uh, the P type, of course, uh, was correct. So let's talk about quantification. Um, so it's um, uh, it's the latest thing we have implemented using that reference sample. Uh, we have done dopant quantification of uh, SMIM images in semiconductors, and our next um, will be to do K value. We're working on making standards of K value material to, to provide as a reference. So what does this do? It's an automated process for quantifying uh, the dopant level of images, SMIM images. The user sets up the device uh, to image as you would normally do. And then the system guides you step-by-step. Step. It takes a reference measurement, and then the results are displayed as a false color map. Uh, to demonstrate this, we have a, an interesting um, sample that was made uh, for us, this was uh, two wafers that were taken from different lots, diced up, and then the, the individual die were glued face to face. So you have uh, from left to right, you have sample A from lot A and sample B from lot B. And in the middle, you have epoxy as shown here on the right. These were uh, glued face to face. The very top layer was an epitaxially grown um, a layer that was doped with n-type um, dopant and the substrate is p-type and uh, what you this is the false color image showing the level of the dopant and if you can place your cursor in any plate in any position you can get a a line cross section and this looks very similar to a sims depth profile but with nanoscale resolution in depth. And uh, the point of this a particular exercise, even though it's a nice picture to show, was that uh, lot A and lot B did have a, a little bit of a difference in their peak concentration. And this was a, a nice way to display that uh, and also makes for a nice example. Um, again, the checkerboard indicates that we were not able to resolve um, a polarity or a, a dopant, in this case, the epoxy, that's obvious. But what happened here is we're actually seeing the depletion region between the N and P. So there are no carriers there. So we get uh, we don't get a signal. Uh, we don't get a phase change. And uh, we identify, we can identify the space charge region here on this sample. And the next uh, <clears throat> effort on this uh, was to see how repeatable this is. And uh, we did static repeatability measurements. Uh, we did 10 measurements uh, repeated in a uh, static way and then also dynamic way. Um, because our measurement is extremely sensitive, we actually control the temperature of the environment inside the enclosure of the AFM. And uh, we've... Uh, We've uh, built our own temperature controller that provides 0.1 degree centigrade per hour control of temperature because small variations in temperature will affect the, um, there's a temperature coefficient on our RF generator and the cables. Uh, so we want to eliminate those variations and make this a repeatable um, measurement. And uh, we have measured the repeatability to be about a 10th of a decade of concentration uh, for each of the dopant levels. And this is shown here with the error bars of uh, 10 repeats. Uh, these are the dopant levels represented in capacitance, which we then translate into uh, concentration. Um, in reality, it's a free carrier concentration, but that is relative to the dopant level. So now I'd like to go into a, a few additional case studies, an integrated gate bipolar transistor. 
And in this case, we're, um, uh, scanning capacitance was used to look for uh, defects and uh, characterize this device, but uh, uh, the uh, amount of information that the microwaves provide is quite significantly higher. You can very clearly see the gate um, oxide around this trenched gate. Uh, you can tell the dopant level differences. And there is a defect here that was not visible in scanning capacitance. Um, and this is uh, showing some of the um, great detail uh, that the uh, microwaves provide in this uh, scanning microwave impedance microscopy. Uh, this sample is courtesy of Tech Insights as was the uh, image sensor. I'd like to say thank you to them for these samples. And uh, next, I want to uh, cover a, a real life example that was published with us in TSMC. Um, they had a uh, defect. Uh, these are test structures, and there was a, a, a electrically bad test structure, of, uh, a gate test structure. And um, they wanted to know if this was a defect in that particular location, if it was a single defect in that gate, or was this something that was a contamination that uh, might spread across uh, adjacent gates and that you have a different uh, issue to resolve. Um, but electrically, there was only one bad location. And uh, this was already processed uh, to contact and uh, there was no way to access this gate. So what we did is we contacted the probe to a contact to the gate and extended our probe basically into the oxide, to the, the gate itself, and, and, and sent the microwaves into this gate and tested the, uh, the failing device and the adjacent devices and did uh, CV. Uh, we saw the hysteresis on the bad device and uh, good devices were uh, without hysteresis. Yet uh, what we did discover is that the adjacent uh, test structures also had hysteresis indicating that this was really a, a contamination that spread uh, to adjacent devices. Um, and uh, this was not picked up electrically, but uh, we were able to pick it up in this fashion. Um, and the reference is uh, here was the uh, ISFA conference, the 42nd ISFA conference uh, where this was published and presented. Uh, here are some images of FinFETs. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, a complete semiconductor presentation if we didn't cover uh, FinFETs. Uh, here we're looking at the wells, uh, the NMP wells in a FinFET. This is the straight capacitance image. Uh, the dopant levels do give different capacitance levels, but if you do uh, DC DV, the phase itself gives you the polarity. So here we're looking at again blue and yellow, uh, indicating N and P, um, and you can differentiate uh, the wells quite well, and even the depletion region around them, um, uh, sh showing a fairly decent resolution on these uh, on this 14 nanometer FinFET uh, device. Lastly, uh, this one is a little bit of a mind bender to understand. It's a nonlinear device. So these nonlinear devices uh, have a, uh, if you apply a voltage, um, they will change the resistivity. Uh, and at some point that there's a threshold at which resistivity goes from high to low. It's a mind bender because we're actually doing two different measurements here, if you will. We're applying a DC voltage and sweeping that voltage. So we are sending a current, but we can limit that because we're not actually measuring the response of that current or the resistance change to that current. We are measuring the microwave response to sending that current or uh, applying that voltage sweep to the sample. So we can, it's one of the least invasive ways to look at this nonlinear material and find out where the threshold is for the change of resistivity, um, um, unlike a, a pure electrical measurement. So the uh, microwave tip was, uh, was uh, ramped uh, in voltage and the microwave uh, response was, is plotted here to determine the threshold voltage for the change of the resistivity of the uh, nonlinear material. Uh, lastly, it's just a couple of images of silver nanowires. These were in uh, PET, an organic material. These are used for touch displays. And the interest here was to know if uh, these individual 
silver nano wires are touching each other to know where they are and the capacitance signal actually does give you a different contrast when they're touching and when they're not touching and you can clearly see them this was taken in tapping mode um, the topography doesn't really show much but uh, this is a capacitance image in tapping mode showing a pretty good resolution of these uh, the silver nano wires uh, through an insulating material uh, okay i'm almost done so summary uh so um scan wave uh, s main profits very high uh, sensitivity for electrical ifm measurements uh, very high resolution um, it requires little to no sample prep you can quantify dopant levels and you can uh, identify otherwise invisible defects localize them uh, and i presented to you uh, how it works with buried structures dopant imaging and quantification dielectric films, power and logic devices, and nonlinear materials, just uh, to give you an example of some of the uh, applications of this technology and uh, future quantification of dielectric constant is what we're working on today. Uh, there's a lot of people to thank, but I do want to thank you for your interest and participation. Um, Tech Insights has provided some of these samples. And again, a big thank you to them and my colleagues at Prime Nano. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for staying up so late. Hopefully we didn't wake up your families. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Well, actually for a lot of questions because we're going directly into the discussion panel afterwards. So if anybody has one, please let me know. Let's see if there's anything offline. Um, I have a question for you um, in the meantime while we're sure. waiting because you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your talk that you can do um, in both contact mode and tapping mode. Is there advantages or disadvantages or it de depends on what you're trying to measure? Uh, there's, uh, it primarily depends on what you want to measure. If you have a adhesion problem, soft material, you want to use tapping mode. Uh, you do get a little uh, lesser of a signal in tapping mode. And uh, in the quantification, it really, for the quantification, you can't use tapping mode because we don't have, uh, we, we do certain things to, uh, to quantify the signal that uh, that particular aspect doesn't work in just the quantification, everything else it works, but you have a little uh, loss of the signal in tapping mode. Okay. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot for your interesting presentation. I just have a question regarding your point made. Um, very few or basically no sample preparation. <laughs> just a question. Is it possible to use, for example, focused ion beam crossed um, TEM lamella or whatever uh, to to go into yeah, the measurements you, you mentioned? I mean, how sensitive is it uh, with regard to the surface, let's say, damage you create? Um, so a TM lamella would have to be um, somehow placed flat on something rigid. Yes. Yeah. Um, assuming you can do that, that's a lot of sample prep. Uh, I, <laughs> I have done that, it's challenging. Um, if you can mount it that way, um, you could collect information. Your question was how sensitive is it? Uh, I guess it really depends on what it what what you're trying to image. Um, most materials, including our tip, will have a native oxide. So if you're trying to look at uh, semiconductor material dopants, I believe that uh, you will get that information, even though it's a very thin lamella. I assume we're talking about tens of nanometers. Um, what I would do is I would mount this on a metal plate or something that would reflect most of the microwaves so you get all of the information from just the lamella. Okay, maybe I can be more specific. Yes. Uh, the hem lamella was kind of misleading. I mean, of course, we would um, tip out a, a thicker block, so to say, but my main concern was regarding the surface damage you create during right. the cross-section. The gallium or, or whatever else. Exactly, um, yeah, or even right. uh, crystal damage. Yeah. 
Um, so yes, we would. Um, uh, well, if you're doing gallium fib, I, I would uh, I would be certain that the gallium will influence the measurement because it is a dopant in in most semiconductors. So um, if you're not doing gallium fib, uh, the other the requirement would be that you are uh, AFM smooth. That's just you really need to be in the no more than a few nanometer surface roughness. So if you if you have if you have curtaining effects and those types of effects from the from the fib, uh, you might uh, just have too much topography and topography variations do influence the capacitance measurement because capacitance has a distance the distance between the plates uh, component it's an inverse relationship. So I would say gallium is a no no uh, and. Uh, getting a smooth surface would be the next uh, thing if, if you're not doing gallium. Okay, thank you. You seem to have sufficiently uh, answered his question. Any other questions? Mm, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, actually, my question would be to Derek, if this is okay. Since yep. um, Derek, also thank you. Oh, that's a very nice talk. I was wondering, if I'm not mistaken, you would need to use a um, gold-coated cantilever or silver-coated cantilever for PIFM measurements. Is there any chance that we can use also other kinds of cantilevers that has um, different kinds yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. So we've definitely played with... Um, platinum cantilevers actually work um, surprisingly good. And that's partly because they... Um, they're a little more inert, you know, gold actually likes to pick up organics a little bit uh, more readily. So we find uh, platinum iridium to actually be a bit better and they last longer, you usually get about two to three times more uh, lifetime out of them. So those are quite nice to use. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so far that's, that's really the, the sphere we've worked in. We've tried other ones, you know, platinum psilocides, uh, these kind of more exotics, but uh, yeah, just a, a standard old platinum meridian works pretty well. Okay. And we had uh, some experiments done a few years ago on also iodide containing materials. And we always saw that we had something like an etching problem that where the iodide would etch both gold and platinum cantilevers. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> um, could you maybe recommend any other more inert cantilever than that? Uh, so, no, unfortunately, that's not a space we've worked in too much, like where things would be a bit caustic, if you will, to the to the tips. Uh, one possibility, if you want to do the prep, of course, would be to have a, a metal surface and a silicon tip. Now, we haven't experimented with this much, but uh, in principle, it should work, where instead of using the tip as being the enhancer, you could use the sample as the enhancer. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. We have a couple of questions offline, so I'll start with um, with Dr. Albert Minge. Um, I have a question to Nicholas. First of all, very impressive talk. I loved it. Uh, so Thank I'm very impressed. Up, I'm mm -hmm. impressed to know about the uh, scanning microwave impedance technique. Uh, would like to know a little bit about quantification of dopants in materials that we are not so aware. Well, not we are not so much aware of. Mm -hmm. For example, if we are dealing with semiconductors uh, where it is difficult to obtain calibration samples or reference samples, how can we quantify such? <laughs> we, we have looked at the compound semiconductors, but um, many of these techniques require a reference. Um, without a reference, it's a relative measurement. So I, I don't have a solution. It's it's all right. Yeah. So for, um, for example, to be specific, uh, on garnet, we commercially we'll no, not find this staircase doping uh, in uh, in gallium nitride. So I believe that we cannot use other samples like silicon for for estimating doping in GAN. Um, you you. Probably cannot, yeah, you probably can't use sil uh, silicon reference. Um, uh, but all you need is really two points, right? You need yeah. to have two, two, two samples, preferably bracket where you are going to be. Uh, so you cover the range of what you want to measure. 
And um, I would think a place like IMAC could make those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay. The well, good thing about this is that, that this uh, your technique has a uh, log linear behavior. So I guess right. only two points should be sufficient for, for that. Right. Uh, we uh, yeah two point minimum and sh they should be you know on uh, outside of the range you typically want to measure. Yeah. Um, and we do have some uh, sometimes uh, uh, we we find that the reference and the sample because perhaps of activation energy differences yeah. uh, is a little bit offset and we've included an offset. So if you know one one value we can offset the whole image. All right. And uh, second question is about the uh, resolution. How did you come up with the uh, 10 nanometer, less than 10 nanometer number, if the microwaves can travel really long? Um, well, everything's relative. So they travel, <laughs> uh, they typically get absorbed in most of the materials we deal with uh, within a, a couple hundred nanometers, two to 300 nanometers, they, they're absorbed. But again, we're looking at the reflection and we, it's a near field technique. And we have, um, we have uh, what, we, what we believe is happening is the, uh, there is a point on the tip. The tip itself is tens of nanometers, but we believe that in every tip, there's one sharp point that is really doing most of the emitting and collecting. And, uh, in that uh, graphing bilayer, the twisted graphing bilayer, um, that was probably again a, a, a sharp point on the tip was really doing most of the imaging, and the, uh, and they also used the um, moisture on that, so they had a an additional uh, way to 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 uh, contain the the field, if you will. Um, but in devices that we know the dimensions, uh, we, we typically resolve uh, 10 nanometers or better. All right, all right. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. So I think we have one other um, offline question um, regarding a, a dual SPM. Can we uh, open this up to the CKI? Hi, should, should I be uh, should I ask here online? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah okay. Uh, so I uh, actually you re replied my previous question that uh, is possible uh, that this scan wave is um, can be integrated with other systems besides broker. So I wonder like actually currently we're holding the Joe SPM model and we actually have the older version of scan wave. So it, to up to to able to perform these higher resolution measurements, do we have, is it possible to upgrade it or we have to purchase a new scan wave uh, device? <laughs> Any advice? Uh, um, I, I think we should take this offline if you want to. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that would be better actually. Please. Thank you. Yeah, please contact us. So we can, I can certainly address that offline. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, my question would be for Dr. Novak on the molecule uh, imaging. I was wondering if, if the product is compatible with imaging in liquids. And a um, uh, side question is if there is any size or weight limitation for the samples to be measured. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, so the difficulty with liquid, of course, is it absorbs a lot of IR. So we do have a design where you can kind of come in from below um, through like a zinc selenide window and then image uh, just kind of that, you know, whatever, whatever material you deposit there and then have within solution. Uh, doing something uh, where you're coming in above the, the imaging location of interest and then focusing down, uh, we don't have a solution for that currently. Uh, in terms of sample size, um, we are, are our kind of our uh, workhorse tool uh, was originally designed just to do kind of sample coupons. So something on the order of, um, you know, uh, one, let's see, maybe 40 by 40 um, uh, millimeters in size kind of samples, and a little bigger if, if necessary, and then about uh, 10 millimeters tall. Uh, but um, 
we now uh, have a model that we haven't formally advertised, but we have been selling uh, that ha can do a 75 millimeter uh, travel range in the stage. So the sample can be much bigger and the sample could be um, 20, 30 millimeters tall if, if necessary. So that can handle quite a, a larger sample. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers like all the realms you're looking for. If there's a specific sample of interest you have, we, we certainly could uh, have, have a call offline as well to, to discuss what you're trying to solve. Thank you.